Hi, I'm Alexandra McCarthy. I'm an illustrator and comic writer. My projects are Burnt Toast, which is a webcomic, and uh, Reluctant Hero, which is a manga that's coming out very soon. You can find me on Twitter and Instagram and my website, www.one, the number one, hyphen, in, hyphen, 100, the number 100, .co.uk. And that should have all my links to my social media page and my Patreon. Or you could find me on my link tree, which is the word one, underscore, in, underscore, 100. And that's where you can find all of the work there and more about more information about Reluctant Hero as well. And you're watching Two Geeks Talking. Good morning, afternoon, evening, everyone. Two Geeks Talking is an entertainment industry interview show where we interview the creative people from the comic, film, TV, movie, and video game industries. And of course, I'm your host, Kurt Sasso. We are joined today by a very talented individual. She is, of course, a manga and comic creator, a very talented artist as well, too. Uh, you've seen her work from a variety of other things, specifically with Reluctant Hero and, of course, the Burnt Toast uh, webcomic, which I happened upon and I didn't realize you created, which I've been following it for a while. I didn't realize that. So it's it's a hilarious comic. We're joined today by the ever-talented Alex McCarthy. How are you doing today? I'm doing good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, I didn't know you followed that. I, I didn't know if it was, like, known, really. <laughs> it's on my radar. I, I have a lot of webcomics I still follow over the past 15 years, and, and yours just happened to be in the list, so to speak. So I peruse it from time to time for whatever I get <laughs> to it. Thanks for coming on the show. Greatly appreciate it. For those that don't know anything about yourself as a creative person, tell us who you are and what you're bringing to Two Geeks Talking. I'm an illustrator, and I am a comic writer. <laughs> But I've only started really getting to like proper comics. So we're looking at here as one of them where it's it's more of like a full fledged story, whereas Burnt Toast is more about just like everyday sort of like annoyances or just mishaps or anything like that, or things that have happened to me that I've, like I exaggerate. Plus, the stuff that I find funny that I like hope other people find funny, because I think a lot of my humor is kind of like surreal because i watch a lot of like surreal comedies like father ted and the simpsons those kind of genres really i mean for me i've i always loved monty python and faulty towers and, mm. and everything like that father ted as well too and uh, a bunch of others that uh, i grew up on british comedies <laughs> as well yeah. so I, I love the dry sense of humor yeah well. They do the cringe humor very well as well like the office and i don't know if you've seen peep show no, that's good. It's like from like a point of view perspective, like it's filmed as a first person point of view perspective. So when things go wrong, you really feel it. <laughs> <laughs> nice. So that's something I have to add to my list of shows that I'll, I'll eventually get to. <laughs> <laughs> you said you're you're an illustrator, and of course, comics are are something you're you're trying out right now too, and you're doing very well with it as well. So let's talk about some of the the works that you've done currently here, of course, and and with Burnt House Comic, you've already mentioned it's things that happen to you on, on your life that annoy you, which I think is a great tag, tagline in itself, if you haven't used it already. But uh, what is Reluctant Hero about? Because I, I looked at the artwork for it, and I love, it was an interesting concept, and I love the artwork. So so tell us about that, because that seems it seems interesting. It's about a young girl called Asta, and uh, her best friend is called Lola. And Asta starts her first year of uni. She's like studying film and she wants to be a screenwriter and her best friend her childhood friend Lola she's second she's in the second year and she's become a bit busy and preoccupied with her own degree because she's doing psychology and Asta feels a bit left out and she doesn't know how to connect with other people she's very socially awkward and she she clings to people you know that have been in her life for a long time and she doesn't know how to make new friends and She's like, well, why don't you just make friends in your new class? They'll like things that you like because she really likes superheroes and sort of like pop culture. And she's like, oh, OK, yeah, they'll probably have the same sort of interest. And when she goes to the class, they don't like anything that she's into. They're all into like art house films and those kind of snooty media students. It's, it's like a parody of them because my sisters did media studies and they hung around with a lot of people like that. 
So it was just like, oh, no, I like this French film from 1954 and stuff like that. And she's like, oh, okay. And they're like really slamming superhero films. So a bit of a mix take on like how Martin Scorsese was a bit like, "Mm, not for me, which is fine. (laughs) So then she feels like outcasted and then she walking home one night after being brushed off by Lola again. Because she's like, oh, I'm busy. Like, you know, you need to do your own thing. She stumbles across someone who's like offering her a leaflet for a martial arts society. And she's like, oh, OK, maybe that will make me confident. I'll go to that. That'll be fun. And then she goes there and she meets this other girl, Mallory. And she's really into the same things that she's that Asta's into. And they're like, we should make a film, we should make a film, we should, um, you can be the hero and I can be the villain. And then she's like, all right, that sounds fun. Yeah, why not? Because then I can submit something for my class. Things start to go a bit off the rails. Mallory gets a bit too into it. Then it just becomes increasingly more dark as it goes on. I'll skip past the part because I, I, I went to film school uh, as well. So I'll skip past the part of uh, the artistic art snobby type thing that you mentioned because i i remember those people well and it wasn't just the students it was the professors too yeah no yeah oh of course it's going to be the professor in my book as well he's going to be like what no (laughs) (laughs) yeah it it was uh they're an eclectic bunch of people the creative (laughs) people in its own right and (laughs) it's not just film it's you get those type of people everywhere you go in illustration there was and in like fine art and but then there's people just like, I just want to make something fun or it doesn't have to be that deep. I like thinking about deep and romanticizing things and stuff, but like not everything has to be deep. I had a double major in visual arts and film. So I had, I had the best of both worlds. So it's, uh, they're two sides of the same coin. Some are very pretentious. Others are, are very aloof and it's really just the same medium in just two different aspects is all it is. But Yeah. I mean, there's also like, you know, personal taste and everything. And It's a great setting for, for your comic, I think. It's, it's a great avenue where not a lot of comics really go into the real life, quote unquote, real life aspect of, of the university life these days. It's usually just moved on. I have a job. Oh, I'm now transported to another world. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I was thinking about when I was writing it, I was like, should I actually give them powers or should I actually make, you know, eventually give them powers? And I thought, no, I think the realism is probably more effective in this kind of scenario because it's making fun of the fact that they're in that kind of make-believe sort of world. And it's more of like a psychological thriller in that sense because she's like Mallory's out of touch with reality. And it's just also about friendship and how people can be gaslighted into friendships as well it's not just romantic relationships where people can get like abused and like mentally abused and things like that uh, a lot of it happens with just everyday relationships looking at yourself then as, as a creative person why is art important to you as an illustrator and of course uh, in creating what's your your comics well it's important because it's more just about expression and I get really low sometimes. And like when I'm away from my, my um, art, I'm just like itching to draw. Mm-hmm. Like it's like a weird feeling. It's like, you know, when they say with actors, they've been bitten by the acting bug. It's like a drawing bug. It's like you have to, there's something in you that's just like, oh, I need to draw. I need to do this now. I'll have days where I, I can't do anything. I'm really procrastinating. And that makes me feel so anxious. Like, I've always got this feeling I want to draw, but then it's like my body won't let me draw, like a mental block. Always made me feel, like, special as well, because growing up, people were, like, always like, wow, you can draw, that's really cool. It just made me feel, like, different in a good way. It was like a weird ego thing. Getting acknowledgement for for a skill and a talent Mm. is always great to have whether whether it's as an artist or or a filmmaker or whatever the case may be it's not just your peers saying it it's like the normal people that don't understand what an artist actually is Mm, it's like it's also when i was at school i was very shy and there was a point where i was getting bullied it made me feel 
that was like the only good thing about me. Like obviously now I've grown, I know there's there's more to me than just drawing because that would be very unhealthy. It did make me feel like, oh, that's something that I've got and that's something that can keep me going. And there was a point where I was really like down when I was getting bullied and I didn't draw at all. But then I kind of like started drawing my emotions. So it was like art therapy because I wouldn't say what happened. I wouldn't say like I'm getting bullied. So I, like they had to say like, well, you you can draw it out and I think that was really good so art is really powerful with with just getting people's thoughts and feelings out which is it's a really important you don't have to be like good at art to get your emotions out either you can just scribble (laughs) you know you don't have to be like art is a skill you can learn as well so like people always said it's like it's like a talent I think partly it is but partly it's more of a you can learn it it's just I think talent means you pick things up quicker it's not just about talent, it's about putting what, what's up here onto a surface of some kind. It's to, it's to get that, that creative release and that, that emotional release out there. And I, I think that it comes down to just putting ink blots on a page, folding it in half and describing what your feelings are type situation or what you're mm-hmm. seeing. It's more of a, a creative expression that I think a lot of people, like you said, can learn, but it's also something along the lines of it's amazing what you can create just with a little time and, and a couple of mediums. Oh, yeah, definitely. And, and you can draw inspiration from any kind of medium as well. It doesn't have to be like other people's artwork. It can be, for me, it's TV. So like uh, American and British comedies were my main source of inspiration. I don't know, I just find humour really powerful to telling stories and things like that and getting like really serious messages across for humour. Because it, it lightens it. It doesn't make it feel, like, too heavy. The Simpsons were very good at, like, poking fun at, like, politicians and things like that. And like I said, Father Ted earlier, that's, like, I'm um, from a Catholic background. My family loved that because it's it's Ireland. My mom's Irish. So, like, we watched that. and It, <laughs> it should be really offensive to us, but it's it's because it's so silly. Yeah. I mean, they had like a hotline for priests and things like that. So it's just, it's really over the top that it makes it just seem, it's just fun, isn't it? I wouldn't class it as like it's completely blasphemous, but it <laughs> makes some good points in there as well. Yeah. About how the church is run and things. So, and I think that's ni- a nice balance to for comedy, which I try and do in my book. I try and make it like more surreal. It's like stuff that can't really happen in real life. <laughs> but some of it has, because there's a comic of me stepping in, like, Lana for center, and that's real, because I did do that. So I just thought that was funny. But there are things that you can just tell that didn't happen. What's the most misunderstood aspect about being an artist that the general public doesn't understand? They don't understand how much work goes into it. They think a lot of it, especially, like, I've had family members who are just, like, can't you just do this and knock it out in like a like half an hour? I'm like, no, because there's a lot of prep work. So if I have to draw a building or, or something, it's going to take a while. So I'm going to have to sketch it out. Then I'm going to have to ink it. Then I'm going to have to like color it. And that takes a long time, especially when it's when you work digitally. They're like, isn't it already halfway done for you if it's digital? I'm like, no, it's not pressing a button and it's it's there. I wish it was like that. It's a lot of the the work they don't understand. They don't understand that a lot of artists have to do their own post and like they have to mail things out to people. They have to like list things on their website and that takes like a big chunk out of your day. They have to do a load of research. They have to do loads of edits. So like before I had an editor for my manga, I had to really chop and change things a lot, really go back and think, did that make sense? Does that link up? And that took a long time to do. That took a few months to do. They just don't understand how much time goes into creating even just a single piece of art, mangas and and comics. It's several pieces of art in one page. So yeah, I'd say that. That's the, the thing that they don't seem to grasp. I think people are like that with a lot of, things though they're like if they don't do it themselves especially art in general even even film films for that matter it's not just a matter of you do the scenes in order and away you go it's it's about scheduling and time and getting the right act oh. everything like that as well too it's it's a nightmare it can be i love listening to behind the scenes stuff a lot 
So I like to know the process of a lot of things, but not everyone's interested in that. Yeah. They're just like, just give me the film. Give me. <laughs> what, isn't it done yet? I mean, come on. Just... Yeah, it's been, it's been six months. Come on, yeah. let's the film. And then they'll get mad at the, the effects aren't very good. And be like, well, you did pressure them. I mean, have you ever tried to do a full running, you know, one take gunfight scene in a warehouse when yeah. you think it's just magic? Come on now. I yeah, this is the thing. And I do get really impressed with stuff like that. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. And there's a lot of things in film and that are just boring that people just don't want to think about, like the whole safety and lighting setup and sound. Yeah. And yeah. Things. It was like, you know, it'd be it'd be nice for for them to understand, like, hey, it's mm. not just it's not all CGI and Marvel and DC and all that stuff. With the art, it's not just all drawing, like pretty pictures. It's a lot of work. <laughs> does art energize you, or does it drain you? It really depends. So, like, sometimes I'm really energized to do a piece, and then it just depends on my mood that day. I think just more about how I'm feeling on the day. I often chop and change what I'm working on so I don't get bored. I'd just burn out if I just stuck to one project. So what's your creative kryptonite? I'm overthinking. So I'll overthink to the point where I'm like, is that a good idea? And just not get anything done. It took a while for me to like really decide to do Reluctant Hero because I was like, is it a good idea? Is it not a good idea? Should I do another? Should I think of some, something else? Then you just don't get anything done then. Creative paralysis. Yeah. Yeah. yeah it's definitely, uh, definitely happens for sure. Like I've, I've started scripts and I've gotten like halfway through a concept and then it's like, why am I doing this? Like, <laughs> I don't get it. Like I, I thought it was this great idea, but I don't have a finish. <laughs> I think I've had many moments of self doubt throughout and I'm just like, Oh, is that, oh, I don't know. Maybe it's not that strong. Maybe people won't like it. When I explain it to people, I don't know if it's um, how, because I get nervous explaining things. Mm -hmm. Some people are like, okay. I'm like, oh, no, they're weirded out by the idea. <laughs> That's not a good sign. But maybe they're just like, okay, I, I don't know. I don't, I, I wish I knew what people were thinking all the time. That would be, if I was had any superpower, I'd want that. <laughs> you say that now, but might not be the best solution. Mm, that's true, actually, yeah. I mean, you might pull a whole Jean Grey type situation and just decide to wipe out most of the universe. Oh, uh, yeah, definitely. Uh, yeah, I think I definitely would go full <laughs> on Phoenix. Uh, looking at your, your manga itself here, you know, what is it about manga that that you enjoy? Because it's, it's definitely, I think, a misunderstood medium, even though all it is is just a different word for comic. Yeah, it is. Um, I think people see it as like either too girly or too risky, I'd say. My sister worked at a bookshop and she would get me some mangas because I used to really like like Pokemon and card captors. I'd watch that every morning and she saw comic form and was like, oh, Alex will like them. And she got me them, and I, I would be, I'd read them all the time, and maybe more of an outcast because that's uh, <laughs> really manga. But it was, it was somewhere I could escape, and I read a lot of like um, shoujo mangas, so very girly romance ones. Some that I was like, maybe I was a bit too young to read. So I remember reading one called like Hot Hot Kimmy. That one was a bit. It was it was like a like all the guys that she had after her were just really toxic. I don't know which one's the better one really out of all these guys. The one was like her half brother, and I was like, no. And one, <laughs> one was one one pretty much assaulted her and was really horrible to her. And then the other one I think was nice, but then also ended up being a jerk. So. That was the only three options. I was just like, mm, maybe she should just not have a boyfriend. But they were like really good escapisms to just sort of relax and think about other things. And there was a few magical girl ones, which I really liked. Like Moon Phase, that was, that was more about vampires and things like that. So anything that was a bit more like fantasy-ish. I think it's the art as well. I was just really drawn to the big eyes because I used to really love Powerpuff Girls and that was more, one of my first 
influences as well. I really love the Power of Girls. I used to watch it all the time and had pretty much all the merchandise and stuff. I was a bit nuts on, on Power of Girls. Now the question is, which one was your favourite? It was between Buttercup and Bubbles. So I went for a phase of like really loving Bubbles and then really loving Buttercup because she was tough. I think I liked her because she was like, yeah, I don't, I don't need anyone. I'm like so self-reliant and stuff like that. So, But Bubbles was just cute. So, and I also liked the, the episode where she she was tough and she was like, I'll show you, don't underestimate me. I love characters where they're like, I love the underdog characters. So like any any character that's just like underestimated and goes on this arc of like proving people wrong. It's just something I really relate to. So I'm always drawn to those kind of characters. It sounds like you're also including that in your mangas and, and comics as well too. So I think it's it's a great character to develop over time over a story because eventually they'll either find themselves or you know they'll go down a rabbit hole of some kind yeah basically like things like coming of age stuff i really love so it is kind of like a coming of age story and it's also like how like for lola's story it's like she she takes her for granted a lot she just thinks she's always going to be there because she's been friends with her for so long and she's kind of like just go off and do other things and just let me be because she knows she'll come back to her eventually and she's like it's not a big problem but like when she starts spending time with Mallory more like asks to spend more time with Mallory Lola's like actually no they get on really well and now I feel like "Mm, maybe something's up maybe I maybe I have treated her badly and she doesn't really realise that herself. Like, a lot of the characters don't understand their own thought processes a lot of the time because they're still, like, learning about life. What's the most important quality of being not only a writer but an artist in, in comics and manga today? And how does that translate to what you've created? I think it's good for women to be in comics and more, like, diversity in comics because I get a lot of people come up to my boyfriend at Comic-Con and ask about my manga and things like that. And I don't think that people, I don't think they mean it in a bad way. I think because they're just so used to seeing men behind the store doing, selling comics. I think they're used to seeing female artists, but they're not used to seeing like them making comics. But it's normally like, you know, like merchandise and stuff like that, which I do as well. So I think that's where the confusion comes in. But I don't think people are intentionally been kind of sexist but I think it's like ingrained into people because the comic industry is very male dominated and it started with men so it's like how Disney started with men as well so like Disney's more diverse now you think when it first started it was just a couple of guys and like women couldn't do animation they weren't allowed they had to just be tracers which is kind of tedious work that was the only kind of creative role they could go into i think it's important to for like more people with like different backgrounds and and stuff to to go into comics because you get different perspectives as well like through storytelling so there's just more variety in the stories everyone has a different creative process when it comes to not only writing but also when it comes to art as well too and so so tools that may be similar are are utilized differently do you is there a is there an artistic process that you especially digital. I think digital processes are fascinating because I'm not an artist. I don't know much about that side of, of things here. But is there a, a format that you go to when you say you're drawing a figure versus when you're, say, drawing a background? Or do you kind of have a template of sorts mentally when you're creating your, your work? When I'm trying to do a background, to help me with perspective, I go on, like... The Sims, and I like make a model of what I have in my head because it has the 3D camera thing, so you can get like really cool perspective. It gives you that reference point of how to draw in that perspective. But for figures, a lot of like model life drawing classes were very helpful. And there's actually like a website where you can get like reference images of like life drawing classes, Mm -hmm. and it gives you like 15 minutes, and then you can just sketch them out, and that helps. And the good thing about digital art is, um, I mean, I have a dual monitor, so I have 
one for my drawing and another one for where I can put my references and I can just look over and draw from and draw, get inspiration from look, looking through Pinterest. And having a dual monitor for a digital artist is, I think you need it. It's a game changer. You don't have to keep like loading up browsers and like minimizing things and then going back and forth. You can just turn your head and then it's there. What was an early experience where you learned that language had power? Probably when I was seven or eight or something. I think definitely when I was 11. I had an experience of people just being cruel for no reason, so like being bullied and stuff. And then I realized that these, that kind of language is more impactful than around that kind of age, I think. Looking at media and TV and how a lot of things have messages I mean, in, in primary school and things, they, they have, like, books where it has, like, a message to it, but you don't really take notice to it. I'd say, like, around that age, I think that was when I started to realise. I started to th- um, I've always been kind of, like, a, a sensitive person, so I did always pick up on, on issues. So when the news was on, I used to hate the news because I knew someone had died or some, something tragic has happened and I couldn't do anything about it. Um, and that used to bug me, and I just get really upset. <laughs> so like, I just not watch the news. Got more of a voice now that I'm older because I can like go online and things like that. But as a kid, you're just like, you know, you've got no power really. Yeah. Everyone has one person that inspired them on their path to where they are today. Who was that for you? Yeah, I'd say Craig McCracken was my biggest inspiration, and um, Matt Groening. Because both, like, Pap of Girls um, and a lot of 90s cartoons had a lot of great humour in, in them as well as, like, great storytelling. And the design on the Pap of Girls really influenced me. Nice. From a professional standpoint, you are a, an accomplished artist. You're also a creator of a, a wonderful webcomic with Burnt Toast. And, of course, your manga, Reluctant Hero, as well, too, is, is out. And I'm sure it's... Uh, getting much acclaim as it should so professionally you're successful in that regard do you consider yourself personally successful I mm, no but I think I don't know if I ever would because like even if I got like more stuff or work I don't know I think it's just me I just have like a bit of imposter syndrome sometimes. You know, I think I'm scared to say that like I'm successful. I don't know if I would say that. I'm a lot better off than I was. I'm doing a lot more than I was. So I like to just keep working really. I do think success is like, it's very subjective to the individual. Some people might say that I'm successful but then other people might be like, no. I don't know where to put myself in that kind of category because I just I think if I'm like if I say I'm successful I I think I'll stop trying to do new things and I'll just be like get into like a comfort zone and but then that just might be just me overthinking things the reverse of success is failure how do you deal with your failures I keep trying that's basically what it is I just I just keep trying if there's something that went wrong I try and find out what exactly that was that went wrong Failure hurts and rejection hurts and it doesn't really get easier because it's like, I mean, you kind of get used to it, but like, it's still not a great feeling. It's good to have those failures because then the voice you won't, won't learn from something and being told that you're great all the time and you're doing everything perfectly, it's not going to end up with a nice person. <laughs> you, you end up getting a bit like full of yourself, I think, and then when someone does finally say like, oh, this is terrible. It's like a massive shock. And then to you see them, like, oh, but everyone was telling me I was great. And what? <laughs> this is a different opinion. I'm not used to this. Yeah, I think it's good good for you to have failures and just, you should just learn from them and then keep trying again. You'll get there. The younger generation is looking at your work and they're becoming inspired to be creative in their own way, whether it's as a comic creator or writer or whatever they would like to do creatively. Maybe you've inspired them to on that path. How can they inspire the generation that follows them? I think people will always get inspired by new material. I mean, 
I, I get inspired by new stuff all the time. I don't think the next generation will be like, oh, I can only read new stuff. A lot of them will go to older things. And I just think, just keep creating. If something makes you feel like you want to tell a story and you don't know how to draw or you don't have that kind of ability or you can just go to other people and you can collaborate. There's Discord and, and if you can't meet anyone, just create comics even if you can't draw because there's loads of people who can't draw but can write really well and then people read the comics because the writing's so good and uh, the story's good. So, like, you don't have to have, like, Marvel illustrative skills or like Disney illustrative skills you just need to be able to engage with an audience and I believe there's an audience for everyone no matter what it is no matter how niche it is I think there's an audience for everyone if you like it then someone else will, will like it basically if your life was a manga or a comic or a film for that matter what would its title be and because I like music what would its soundtrack be oh Oh, I listen to music a lot as well, so I don't, I've got so many. I mean, Burnt Toast is kind of like about my life. I think I would want to make a, if, if it was like a serious biography, I did have a name for it. I think I was going to call it something like the memoirs of a nobody. I was going to call it. I'm just a normal person. Normally when you read autobiographies, it's about some, like a celebrity or something. Biography of some random schmo. <laughs> I just think that would that'd be a nice title, but I don't know about music though. That'd be oh, that'd be so. I don't know. What would yours be? I see. For me, I I, I play clarinet, so uh, a lot of orchestral, a lot of uh, film music, a bunch of other things too. So I, I've listened to a lot of stuff, rock and roll. Like I, I'm literally like all over. So that's just me. I like I like a lot of like seventy stuff and like. I mean, I've got my my Spotify. If I just like <laughs> Google it and just have a look, see, I'm very like an all rounder with music. Mm -hmm. I will listen to pretty much anything, and that makes it harder for like to pinpoint what kind of song I would. Have. I mean, I really like the Kinks as well. So anything by them, or anything in an indie sort of rock muse, so difficult. There's too many. You know, I do hate to say it, Axe, but that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talking. I want to thank you so much for coming on the show. Oh, thank you for having me. Where can we find you? How can I? How can we support you, of course, online and, and any websites or social media that you'd like to promote? Um, so it's all under one in a hundred, and that's spelled out as one, the word one, underscore in, underscore 100 and that's instagram and twitter and my patreon is one in a hundred all one word uh, no underscores and it's it has the ah in it as well so i don't know <laughs> how clear that is um and my website is www dot one the number one uh hyphen in and then another hyphen 100 which is the number 100 and dot co dot uk so that's my shop and that's everything there. I mean, that might be better because that goes to everywhere. <laughs> and so does the link tree in my, um, in my Instagram because that, that has all the links there. Well, like I said, that ends this particular episode of Two Geeks Talk. You, you can, of course, find this interview and a thousand plus others literally on our website, ggtmedia.com or twogeekstalking.com. And, of course, on our YouTube channel, which is a lot more updated than our website because, you know, I'm only one person. Give me a break, which is youtube.com <laughs> forward slash tgtmedia. And we do have a Patreon as well, which is patreon.com forward slash tgtmedia. Eventually, I'll be re-releasing re the original uh not anywhere located on the internet anymore podcast archive of two geeks talking where you can hear 15 years of web comic creators and and talented individuals from from the comic industry in that regard and eventually uh i'll find a home for that too who knows but that's beside the point again uh like i say every week everyone has a story it's up to me to help bring that out thanks for listening watching on two geeks talking